Reach, Young Adult Ministry Sermons Online from Thursday, December 10th, 2020, entitled Freedom for the Future, from Romans 5, 1-5, featuring Philip Jackson, pastor to young adults at Evergreen Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and a special two-part crossover series between Reach Young Adult Ministries and the TCC BCM. I'm just going to make myself at home. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you all tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Philip Jackson. I am the, uh, the Young Adults Pastor at Evergreen, uh, which is just down the road at 111th and Mingo. Um, Kyle and I have, like you said, become really close friends over the last couple of years. And um, let's see, we're coming up on two years of friendship, actually. Not a year and a half. Not that you're counting. But that's fine. I mean, yeah, whatever. If you want to round down, that's fine. But um, anyway... Uh, so I, how many of you guys are doing finals right now? Where are you guys at with school? Finals? Yes? Yes. Okay. Uh, I just finished my last final last night at like 11.15. It was due at 11.59. Uh, and uh, I've got a, about two pages left of a paper I've got to write and turn in tonight, which is uh, 12 days late. So there's that. Um, but I wanted to uh, just... I can't, let me tell you a little bit about myself first, and then we're going to get into the Word, just, just a little bit. I'm not going to give you my whole life story. See, I was born. There I was, naked in my mother's arms, screaming at the top of my lungs. I'm kidding. Um, no, anyway, I grew up a uh, Christian home, right? I met Jesus when I was a little kid, have always uh, walked with God and, uh, and been around godly people. Uh, when I, uh, my wife and Lindsay and I, she's right down here. I'm not going to make her wave, but she's in the white buffalo plaid. So you guys can all stare at her. Um, we got married when we were 18 and 19 years old. So yeah, some of you guys are like, holy crap, what? Yes. Uh, and we just, uh, we just had our 16th wedding anniversary in, uh, in last June or this June. This is the longest year of my life. Um, but, uh, Anyway, uh, I did uh, blue-collar work for 11 years. I was a carpenter, a trim carpenter. I built cabinets and furniture for a living for 11 years. Uh, did the trade thing and uh, did well and had a little business. And then uh, in 2009, uh, I had a family, wife and two children, and uh, God called me uh, into government. And so with a, full, with a family and no real way to pay for school, I walked into Rogers State University, go Hillcats, and I uh, signed up to go to college, 24, non-traditional student. Um, and for four and a half years, I studied government, not knowing what God wanted for me. Um, that, uh, that culminated into a dream job. I, I traveled around working in political campaigns professionally for four and a half, for, for five years. Um, and the last, uh, last little leg of that, I worked for our former congressman here. Uh, his name was Jim Bridenstine. He is now the director of NASA. So, um, pretty crazy. Uh, but in 2018, after five years of political work, um, I had uh, the opportunity to free myself of everything and submit to ministry. And so, uh, for the last two years, I just had my second anniversary at Evergreen, and uh, God has been really good. So, um, this week, I don't know how many of you guys were, were at Reach on Tuesday, but Kyle gave a great message uh, about accountability and about the importance of truth and how uh, we are responsible to live in the light. I love the words of the Apostle John, how he paints this picture that we're supposed to be, we're supposed to be people who live in the light. And that being, living in the light, the thing that makes that so um, freeing is that people can see everything about us. You know, if, uh, if you have no secrets... Guess what? You have no shame. And the beautiful thing about being in Christ is that you're going to call me a dirty, rotten sinner? Okay, cool. What else you got? Well, you are an arrogant, proud, you, uh, you, you're lustful, you lie, and you are a cheater. Okay, cool. What else? You see, here's the thing, is that we spend a lot of our lives trying to protect our reputation from other people, thinking that somehow that's going to add to our value. But the truth is the only thing that defines our value 
is what God thinks of us. And think about this. Something is, their value of something is determined by what people will pay for it, right? If you see a, a junky hoodie on the side of the road, are you going to pay cash money for that piece of clothing? Chances are no, right? But if you see a, a diamond ring, people are going to lay down some money for that, right? Well, guess what? What are you worth? You are worth the blood of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, paid on purpose for a purpose for you. That is how valuable you are. So we're going to talk about freedom tonight. We're going to talk about what it means to live in the light, to be free because of what God has done in us, specifically what Jesus has done in us. If you have your Bibles, turn over to Romans chapter 5. I'm going to move this because this is like right up in my business. So let me lay out some context for you here. Romans, chat, Romans is uh, the greatest theological document ever written. And in the Bible, the Apostle Paul, as only he can do, he, he lists out... Um, a lot of great stuff about how we can see the world. See, here's the thing, is that your theology is the most basic thing about you. Now, what does that mean? Your theology is how you see God. And how you see God is going to determine how you see the world. So this is important for us. Because if we have a small view of God, that means that we have a small view of what he can do in our life. And we have a small view of of what he can accomplish in us. But if we have a large view of God, what that means is that there's no limit to what we can do. There's no limit to what we can be a part of. And so Paul goes through in these first couple of chapters and he begins to lay out what it means to be right with God. Here's a mind-blowing thing that I've just learned recently, okay? You guys ready? Sin is not about the things that you do. Sin is about who is in control of your life. Here's what's crazy. Is that in the first couple chapters of Romans, Paul starts to lay out this story. And, he's, and he goes back to Adam and he talks about this guy named Abraham. And he says, look, here's the thing. Is that Abraham was, account, was counted righteous before God, a friend of God, before any of the Bible was written, any of the law was written, before anything had ever happened. He was counted as a friend of God and righteous. Why? Because he had faith in God. Because he believed that God would do what he said he would do. Think about that for a second. If that's the case, then sin is not about the things that I do. God is not up in heaven with a, with a clipboard and a pencil and a checkbox is going, okay, yep. Okay, yeah, wow, we're going really, to have to pay this off for a while. That's not how this works. Sin is about who's in control. Because the Bible says that God is faithful and just to cleanse us of all unrighteousness if we will just confess our sin. If we will just come to him. And so that all leads up to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5 is an incredible piece of scripture. And we're going to look at this tonight and what it means to be free. Specifically, to be free because of our faith. Okay, so check this out. Romans chapter 5, first, first word. Therefore, okay, pause. You guys know I'm going to do this, right? If the therefore is there, we got to find out what it's there for, right? Okay, so because of all this stuff, because sin is not about the things that I do, sin is about control, Romans chapter 4, therefore, okay, that's the key hinge, hinge, hinge word here. Since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, hold on a second. Because faith has always been the means that grace has been given, we have peace with God. Don't miss this. Have you guys ever considered that faith and belief are two totally different things? Think about this. I, as I was looking into the scripture today, I, was, I, had, I had the thought, well, okay, well, I have faith in Jesus. That means I get saved, right? Right? Yes, that's true. But when I did a little bit of word search, here's what's interesting. We know John 3.16, right? 
Let's say this together because it's so good. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Excellent job. Okay? Here's the thing. Is that belief is different than faith. The belief that he talks about in John 3.16 is a verb. Faith that Paul talks about in Romans 5 is a noun. Totally different words. Faith in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, what the Greek means is belief with the predominant idea of trust or confidence, whether God, whether in God or in Christ, springing from faith in the same. Now hold on a second. I'll explain this in just a second. Now, belief, John 3 16, means to think to be true, to be persuaded of, to credit, or to place confidence in. Here's the difference between faith and belief. Okay? Belief is understanding and confirming that a plane can fly. Faith is getting on the plane, buckling yourself in a seatbelt, and actually going in the air. See, James says that even the demons believe that God exists. So you say, oh, well, you know, I'm, do you believe in Jesus? Absolutely. Jesus is great. He's my friend, right? But you haven't put your faith in him. Because faith is belief that has already reconciled itself that it's okay to be challenged. Faith tells me I can walk in confidence because I am willing to put whatever comes my way up against Jesus. Faith gives me the ultimate freedom because no matter what comes into my life, what happens is that I have complete confidence that God is going to take care of it no matter what it is. So faith makes us free. Belief is just acknowledgement of the truth. James says that even the demons believe and tremble. See, to believe is just to acknowledge the truth. But to have faith is a recipe for freedom. See, belief is accepting that what God says is true. But faith changes everything. So the question is, do you believe that God wants you to be free? See, here's the attitude. We don't actually say this out loud, but this is what we think in the back of our mind. Oh, grace, it's free. I'll take some of that. But when it comes to faith, when I've got to give something up, like my independence, my goals, my expectations, hold up. Here's the challenge is that we walk around all day long saying, yeah, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is great. Jesus is awesome. We're so comfortable with the Savior part, but we don't actually like the Lord part. Because the Lord part costs us something. It costs us everything. Why was Abraham such an incredible figure? Because he literally said, oh God, you want me to live over there? Okay, cool. I'm going to go ahead and just abandon my family and go follow you. Faith is belief in action. Faith sets us free because faith builds confidence. We're going to talk about that here in just a second. Faith is the incredible experience of God inviting us to be part of, his, of what he's doing in the world. Now, it may be that you're sitting there and you're like, you're, you're, so, you're excited. You're, you're, you're in the airport looking at the airplane. You're like, oh my goodness, that person just got on the plane. That's great. Good for them. Praise God. God is good. And you're like, I am not getting on that plane. You celebrate people getting on the plane, trusting and, and walking out in faith, but something is just holding you back, and you're like, man, I just don't, don't I, I see it. The plane's going to fly. I see, I see them taking off all the time. But when it comes to actually putting my faith in it and putting myself in that piece of aluminum, all of a sudden, things get real real fast. So how can someone who believes but doesn't have faith, live in confidence. What does that look like? That looks like acknowledging Jesus with your lips, sitting in church on Sunday, and living in terrifying fear and anxiety. 
Anxiety is a big thing in our culture. But you know, you know what anxiety is about? You know what fear, where fear comes from? Fear comes from pride. Because deep down inside, everyone knows the truth. That we're broken. That we can't fix it. So what do we do? We put positive slogans all over our life. You can do it. You're a champ. You're special. You're awesome. You're great. Go move mountains one shovel at a time. Faith of a mustard seed. All this stuff, right? These are all belief statements. But a faith statement is when you get on your knees and you say, God, I've got no hope. You tell me what I'm going to do. What are we having for breakfast? I kid you not, yesterday morning, I was freaking out about my final last night. Because I've had some family loss this summer. My little brother died from alcoholism in June. And I have not been the same. So school and pastoring and preaching and all these things, right, they stack up. And so I haven't been able to pay attention to my schoolwork. If I turn this paper in 12 days late tomorrow, I'm being dead honest with you, I'm probably going to end up, if I'm lucky, with a 72 in the class. If I'm lucky. And I'm used to being an A-B student. Like, I turn, I had to honestly, like, at the end of my class, I've got to say, like, how much of the reading I did. Like, I've got to give a percentage. I was telling Kyle this earlier. And I was sitting there like, you can't cheat at school. It's even worse if you cheat in seminary, right? <laughs> so I had to fill it out honestly. And I'm like, okay, I did all the Bible reading, but I didn't do all this. Click submit. 35 out of 100. That's not fun. But you know what? In faith, we walk in confidence. That means that no matter where the plane goes, I'm getting on board. Because I have seen God do miracles. It's just amazing. Faith gives us freedom. You see, and Jesus is the one that's the vehicle that gets us there. Check this out in verse 1. He says, since we have been declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is the one who makes things right. So think about this. Okay, so have you, ever, have you ever wondered what happened to the people like in the Old Testament? Like how did they get saved? Because Jesus died and then everybody else, like what happened to them? Think about this. God is not limited by time, right? So he's separate from all of our consciousness, all of our understanding. So when Jesus died in the, in the, in the center of the timeline of history, not only did he pay for the sin of everyone that would live, but he also paid for all of the sin of everyone that did live. So think about this. This is why Abraham can be saved by faith. The same faith that saved Abraham is the same faith that you have access to right now today. Because the same God who saved Abraham is the same God who says he wants to save you. Because there is freedom in faith. Faith costs us something. Belief is just an acknowledgement of the truth. We have to understand that Abraham, his promise pointed to what God would do. But for us, we look back and see God. He followed through. That's why he says we have confidence. We've been declared righteous through faith and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ because of faith. Paul's making the point that we know that we're secure in, in this peace because we can look back at God's faithfulness to Abraham. See, and here's the thing, is that this peace right here that he's talking about, this isn't subject to all these external factors. You have a bad day. You have a crisis in your life. You have a sibling that's having issues with drugs and alcohol and sleeping around. You're struggling with something internally. Your parents are fighting. They're about to be divorced. They are divorced. They're fighting. They're, they're going back and forth with each other. It's a hot mess your whole life. Well, guess what? This is a recipe for security and freedom. Because faith comes with freedom. Through faith, we have peace with God. And that means that we're free to live as, as a child of God, not a slave to sin. See, when a person puts their faith in Christ, when they get into the airplane... They let him have control. 
See, here's the deception is we think, oh, well, well, if I'll get on the plane and I'll just jump in the pilot seat and I'll, we'll just go where we want to go. That's where some people get it wrong. They think, oh, well, yeah, I trust in Jesus, but I'm going to give him all the checklists of things that we're going to accomplish. That's not how any of this works. He is Lord. I am not. And when I do that, I give all the responsibility, keeping track of all the details to him. That's the best thing about chasing Jesus is that I don't have to make any decisions. He does them all for me. Faith gives me freedom. Check out verse two. Freedom also comes with hope. Now, this isn't just shallow stuff. This isn't just hollow stuff. Look at verse two. He says, we have also obtained access through him by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. See, in addition to the access to this grace that we have, we've been given unshakable hope. Now, let's talk about that word for a second. Hope. What does that mean? See, later on in Romans chapter 8, Paul says that basically the steady baseline of life is this churning dumpster fire of hot garbage. Okay? He, he, he talks about it like all of creation groans under the weight of sin because there's just constant just but all the time. So here's the thing. I realized this this summer when my brother passed away. So you have, uh, you have these moments where you're good, right? You're good. You're secure. And then all of a sudden, you're not good and you're not secure. What's that about? If God is good and God gives peace and all those things, why all of a sudden am I good but then I'm not good? Think about this for a second. There's no such thing as waves of peace. The baseline is garbage, hot garbage, right? But instead, what Paul says is he says, God sends peace, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. He sends peace that surpasses all understanding, Philippians chapter 4, to guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This peace is real. And what happens is, is that God actually will hold back his peace just for a minute. See, I, had this, I was going through this process when my brother passed away where I was, I was asking these questions, right? And I said, Lord, what's up with this? And he told me something really profound. He said, you know that feeling that you get when you're, when you're upset, when you're in despair from being separated from your brother? My brother was 33 years old. He's a year and a half younger than me. He said, you know that feeling that you get? That pain in your gut? He said, what you feel in a small little sliver I feel being separated from you in infinite magnitude because of your sin. I pull my waves of peace away from you so that you can know how much I love you. So I want to tell you right now, brother and sister, these anxious moments that you have where you feel like you are out of control, you know what that is? That is not God falling off his throne that is God saying, I love you. I'm going to hold my peace for a second just so you remember I'm here so we can keep doing this together. But this hope is real. Romans 8, Paul goes on to say that because of this, the nature of how the world works, all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Right? So he's giving us a glimpse about what he's about to talk about. So, is God totally out of the loop in what's happening? Check this out from Hebrews chapter 4. So if Jesus is the one that gives us access to this hope and his grace, check this out. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says this. It says, therefore, talking about Jesus, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us approach the throne room with boldness so that we may receive mercy 
and find grace to help us in time of need. You know, think about this. If, if faith gives us freedom and faith gives us hope, that means that we're walking in confidence. So back during my political days, uh, I, had to, I had to travel to Washington, D.C. to do some training. Okay, this is kind of cool because I got a staff badge. I don't know if you guys have ever had a staff badge at an event. But you can go places that normally people, people can't go. So I have my staff badge, and there's armed security everywhere in the U.S. Capitol, all these marble halls and important people, right? I'm passing senators in the hallway and stuff, right? But I decide that I'm going to go exploring. And here's the thing is that sometimes I forgot that I had the staff badge on. And I was waiting to get caught and get kicked out of somewhere. But then when the, when the security guards are standing there and then they see you walking and then they just pretend like they didn't see you, it's like, wait a second. I'm kind of special. <laughs> this is kind of cool. This is my Taylor Gabbard impression. I told him I wouldn't mention him tonight, but I had to. It just happened. But here's the thing. Is that when, you, when I was walking through the Capitol, I would forget that I would have that badge on. And all of a sudden, I realized, like, I could go pretty much anywhere that I wanted to go. Think about this. In your faith, in your relationship with Jesus, you have a VIP badge. You can literally be sent anywhere to do anything. There is no limit there's no limit to hope. And there's no limit to freedom. What that means is that we have access through Jesus to be able to do whatever he calls us to do. The word hope here, or this phrase, hope of the glory of God. So check this out. This is cool. It means that God will deliver us into heaven and will keep his promise. That's what makes this hope so real is that God keeps his promises. Because we're looking back at what Abraham did and God's faithfulness to him, because we look back at what God did with all these people in the Bible, guess what? We can walk in confidence. That means that our hope is real. It's tangible. It actually really exists. It's not some thing that God is waiting to have a relationship with us until we get to heaven. Think about this. The most amazing thing about heaven is not the golden streets. It's not the pearly gates. It's not the crystal sea. It's not all these things. Gold is as common as asphalt in heaven. The thing that makes heaven so amazing is the unfiltered presence of God. And so if the prize is God and we have access to God right now, that means that our heaven starts right now. This is a huge thing. Because how many times do we walk around and we're like, yeah, no, I believe in Jesus, but I really don't see any results in my life. Why is he so hard to find? Clearly there's something. Is this thing on? Hello? God? Hello? And the truth is that we're, we're the problem because we're not listening. You see, we've been given a VI pass to do some incredible things. But freedom, though, not only does it give us, not only does faith give us freedom, not only does it give it hope, but also it changes our perspective. Look at this. Verses 3 and 4. It says, and not only that, if that wasn't enough, okay, and not only that, but we also rejoice in our affliction. Because we know that affliction produces endurance, and endurance produces proven character, and proven character produces hope. There's hope again. See, Paul describes how the confidence that comes from hope changes how we see the challenges in our life. He says, this whole freedom thing, this whole hope thing, if that wasn't enough, guess what? Now we get to look at the challenges in our life and actually celebrate. This blows my mind. The word rejoice here, you know what it means? In the original language, it means to celebrate, to boast, to excessively celebrate our trials. Excessively celebrate our trials. Not just like, yeah, I'm getting all joy, this kind of sucks. Just going to put on a you know, happy face and grin and bear it. Excessively celebrate. Have you guys ever seen like at the end of a sporting event where you got, the, you got the champions in the locker room and they've got goggles on and they're spraying champagne everywhere? When was the last time that was your response to a trial? When you're like, yeah, give me some more Jesus. Come on, let's do this. My car just broke down. I don't know. I'm going to pay my tuition next semester. Let's do this. Let's go. That's what he's saying. Excessively celebrate our trials. Have you ever met people like that? They're weird. 
But this is the truth. We excessively celebrate our trials. These afflictions that he talks about, check this out. It means pressure. It's a metaphor. He's talking about the difficulties that we face in our life. We celebrate them because what happens is that we get the opportunity to see God move in our life. See, here's what happens. How many of you have been on an airplane when you go through turbulence? I said that weird. Turbulence. <laughs> turbulence. Turbulence. Right? You're going along. I remember, forget, we, were dry, we were flying to... Uh, I apologize if that's, I'm sorry, that was, inappro- that was inappropriate and insensitive. Um, but you're flying, I was flying an airplane to, to, uh, to Europe one time, right? And it's like nine hours long. Everything's great, right? It was the worst flight of my life. Okay, it's 14 hours long. We were going from Washington, D.C. to Moscow, Russia. And it was overnight. No in-flight entertainment. The in-flight entertainment was literally a loop of fish under the water and just instrumental music for 14 hours, right? And if things weren't worse, weren't, weren't bad enough, sitting there, we're about six hours in, and of course you can't, I can't sleep, so I'm sitting there just not good, and all of a sudden it's like, whoosh. okay, that's weird. And then all of a sudden, like the, you know, ding, the seatbelt light comes on. All of a sudden people are freaking out. Here's the reality, is that we, that happens with us too. Like, we're, we're, we've got faith, right? We're cruising along. This is awesome. We're, we're making it happen. Okay, things are less than ideal. All right, cool. And all of a sudden, whoosh, and then all of a sudden, ding, the seat, fastest seatbelt light comes on. See, here's the thing, is that faith, it gives us confidence and hope. It gives us freedom, but it changes our perspective about how the things in our life happen and why they're there. See, God puts things in our lives on purpose so that he can show us what he's doing for us, so that he can show us, he invites us to come along. Here's the amazing thing. So, so I mean, I don't know why, I'm all over the place tonight, but this paper that I'm writing, okay, it's about the book of Joshua. And I had this revelation while I'm writing this paper. And I realized God could have totally cleared out all of the land of Canaan if he wanted to, and they could have just marched in. Why didn't he do that? Because he wanted to do it with them. And when they tried to do it themselves, they failed. But when they were with him, guess what? They succeeded. Faith comes with turbulence, and it's okay. Because the plane is not going to crash. He goes through this, this equation here where he says that affliction produces endurance, and endurance produces proven character. The end of proven character is hope. See, the Christian life is built on the idea that God knows that without him we're lost and destructive. But he loves us so much that he not only wants to help us heal and grow, but he also invites us to be part of what he's doing in the world. This is an incredible thing. This is why we rejoice when we experience trials, because it's how God displays his glory. It's how God says, I love you. See, for a person without faith, trials and problems aren't fun. But when we see them in the light of God's perspective, we see a divine miracle taking place right in front of us. I've got a really good friend that he uses the phrase God goggles all the time. When you're going through trials, right? When you're seeing with broken eyes, Everything looks fuzzy, and it's broken. But when we stop and we say, hey, God, I'm going to have faith that you're going to take care of it for me. Help me to see. And what does he do? He puts on our God goggles. It's like, oh, wow. I see. I see what's going on around me. This makes sense. Okay, cool. We look back and we see that God has fulfilled himself all along the way. See, freedom changes our perspective. But here's the payoff. Verse 5, check this out. Verse 5 says this. It says, This hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts 
through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Hope doesn't disappoint. I love that. You may be asking the question, you, have may, you, you maybe have been asking the question for a long time. Yeah, I believe in the Jesus thing, but does it really work? It's okay if you ask those questions. It is okay to ask questions. In fact, Jesus tells Thomas, hey, it's okay to ask questions. But blessed are those who believe without seeing. See, this says that the hope that's produced in us is not going to disappoint us. Why? Because God gave us the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Think about heaven again. God is not content for us to wait to have a relationship with him. He is not content to wait until we die to have a relationship with you. He wants you right now. He wants you to know him right now. He wants to know you right now. He wants you to walk in freedom and in confidence and in hope and in unshaking understanding of what is true. Because our world is full of people who are selling cheap stuff. Cheap truth, cheap lies, and they want you to take whatever you'll grab a hold of just so you will give them their money. This is one of the things I love about millennial and Gen Z generations is that we have grown up being micro-targeted too. You know, when we're, when we're we're searching for something on Amazon and all of a sudden we see nothing but those ads on our Facebook or Instagram feeds. We are so skeptical about things that are around us. It saturates us. But you know what? What a lot of people see as a liability, I see as an asset. Because what that means is that you guys have been trained to seek truth. To not be afraid to reject lies. See, the thing about this is that the hope in Christ is real. And it's so real that God couldn't wait to give it to us. How many of you, I don't know if you guys are like this or not, but when I buy a present, my wife will tell you this, I can't wait to get it out of my possession. I'm like, buy a present, give it away. Like, as soon as I get it. In fact, the first year that we were married, married, I forgot her birthday. Why did I forget her birthday? Because I bought her a present for her birthday and I gave it to her early. And then when her birthday rolled around, I got home from work. I'm, you know, decompressing for the day. And she's like, so what are we doing for dinner tonight? Well, I don't know. What do you want to do? <laughs> and she knew what was going on. You ladies, you guys know what's up. Because she was like, do you know what, what, what today is? Brilliant response. You ready? Wednesday. <laughs> Incorrect. My birthday. Right? Here's the thing. Is that I think that God makes some of us this way because this is how he is. Not that he is so impatient that he's going to wait for us and gift us in our disobedience, but that he is so he is so faithful. This hope is so real and it is so not disappointing. That he was like, look, I can't wait for y'all to die. I got to send the Holy Spirit right now. Because you got to know me and I got to know you. That's what makes this so incredible is that it doesn't disappoint. So security comes from the Holy Spirit, right? This is the down payment. Jesus said this is the down payment of the kingdom until all this is over. The Holy Spirit is the one who teaches us. He gives us love and encouragement as we navigate this process of hope. Right? So Jesus gives us access to hope. He gives us access to grace. And then he sends the Holy Spirit. John 17. He says, I'm going to, bring this, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And he's going to come and he's going to teach you everything. He said, I could teach you all kinds of things, but you can't handle it right now. So instead, I'm going to send a teacher who's going to encourage you. That is amazing. That God wants us so much. So check this out. He says here that he has poured out his love in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has given to us. You know what, that, what the original language in Greek is for poured out? It literally means gushes. Think of Niagara Falls. That God has poured out his love in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. This is not a little, okay, that's enough Holy Spirit for today. This is literally, I'm going to take a fire hydrant and I'm going to turn it on. 
because I love you so much. I cannot wait to have a relationship with you. You got to know me. You got to know me. Because right now you're running scared and you're making decisions based on fear because you are so bent on making your own decisions. Remember, sin is not about what we do. Sin is about control. Who's in control of our life? This is the God that's waiting for you. Now, it could be that you have been in church your whole life and you're like, yeah, that sounds great, but I don't see it. I'm going to tell you right now that the facts don't care about your feelings. They don't. This God right here gushes over you. He wants you to be with him. He wants you to have a relationship with him. But you can't just say it with your lips that, oh yeah, Jesus is God. It takes faith. You got to get on the airplane. And some of you, you've lived in church your whole life and you pretended and you haven't ever gotten on the airplane. You can sit there in the airport and you can talk about all the different kinds of planes that have come in and all the different kinds that have gone up, all the different stories of the people that have gone on the airplanes. That's all great for them. But when it comes to actually flying on a plane, you've never done it. And I want to challenge you to make that right. To embrace faith because it'll make you free. Now, some of you, you may have come in here tonight and you don't know Jesus. This is all just weird to you. I don't, you, don't, you don't understand what I'm talking about. But here's the simple truth is that this God, the God that made everything, he loves you. And he wants you to be in a relationship with him. And what that means simply is this. I'm going to take control of my life and I'm going to set it to the side and I'm going to acknowledge that I'm broken. And I'm going to ask God, will you take control? Whatever that looks like. If I'm going to get humiliated, fine. If I'm going to do whatever, fine. I'm going to submit to you because you are God and I'm not. Now it could be also that you've been walking with Jesus for a long time and you're struggling. You've got some turbulence. You've had some turbulence. And you know what? It's wearing you down. I want to encourage you in this. God sees you. He sees you. And He wants you to walk in victory. He wants you to embrace faith and not just belief. To understand that you're going somewhere no matter how long you have been in that seat. You may be doing the TCC thing. You may be going to NSUBA or or another university. And you think, my goodness, how long am am I here? How long have I been here? I'm so sick of this. I'm so tired. But whether or not You think you're moving. If you have faith, guess what? You are. So God has a plan for you. He has made you on purpose for a purpose. And don't miss that. That faith comes with freedom. It comes with hope. It comes with access to grace. And what that means is real radical life change. Freedom from stress. Freedom from difficulty. Freedom from understanding that I am not having to carry the world on my shoulders. Know that God loves you. Know that faith sets you free. And don't be afraid to get on the plane. What's up, everybody? This is Philip Jackson, the pastor of young adults at Evergreen Church. I want to invite you to come to Reach. We meet every Tuesday evening at 6.30 at Evergreen Church, just east of Mingo on 111th Street. For more information, check out our website, reachtulsa.org. You can connect with us on social media and on Instagram by searching for reach.tulsa. Also, be sure to subscribe to our content for the latest sermons and updates. You can also find us on Spotify, iTunes, and wherever you find your favorite podcasts.